Hans, good to Hello. see you again. Good to see you yeah. too. It's been a while, I think. It's a couple of years, yeah. Not couple, actually. It's uh, yeah, you're right. More than a year. Yeah, it should be two. Yeah. Is it two two years now. Wow, man, time flies. I think so. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. Uh, today, just a short intro. My name is yeah. Pavel Kravchenko, founder of Distributed Lab. We are doing this webinar together with Inner Hub in the uh, UAE. And our goal is to bring like the best knowledge, the best people, uh, the best expertise to the audience and uh, like provide with the cutting edge you know, information. And um, we try to cover uh, interesting questions that is hard to find, you know, just on the internet. We get our opinions from people whom we trust and uh, eventually uh, we create like uh, informational you know, ecosystem. Uh, so today we have Anish with us. I know Anish for quite a while and uh, he always was doing some like crazy stuff regarding cryptography, regarding cybersecurity, all these things. So Anish was involved in quite deeply in a few projects. I hope he'll like tell us which and how. Yeah. And uh, we're going to talk about different topics, the topics that uh, like Anish is an expert and I like have some knowledge. So like that would be the agenda. So quite free. So feel free to ask questions um, in the chat. We'll try to cover them as well. So Anish, could you please introduce yourself? Like um, what you've well, been working on? Okay. Or, I know that you have three PhDs. No, uh, no, I don't. I don't actually. It sounds like that. No, absolutely not. Is it, you know, it is other people that make things up. That's absolutely not true. So I'll summarize. Uh, okay. So I, I have worked in various things. So I went to med school. I have a degree in medicine. Then I worked in micropayment systems. Then I briefly worked in various research institutes as a a uh, visiting scientist doing uh, uh, research on cryptanalysis of various protocols. Then I ran a bioinformatics division of a large startup, which actually bought BLNX. Then I went to university to actually do master's and PhD program. Then I was- In which field? Uh, cryptography. Okay. okay. Security cryptography, yeah. And then uh, uh, I went and did consulting uh, for seven years, uh, CAP and Accenture. And then I did retail banking with uh, Lloyd's and HSBC. And I had enough of corporate life. And then I decided I will just do, you know, stuff I like in the blockchain space mostly. And that's what I've been doing for the last four years or so. That's in summary. Okay. Yeah, that's, uh, I've heard that's uh, basically um that's what i know <laughs> okay so can you tell us how uh, how it has happened that you've got interest in uh, cryptography after oh, medicine? sure yeah. no it, it, i was interested in cryptography before i got into medicine uh so my i was born i was born in india it's a state called kerala so my dad used to subscribe to a thing called science today it is a magazine that was in India and uh, in that magazine, uh, I was probably like eight or nine at that point in time. Uh, you know, this, this, this was a magazine that was there, my dad used to read and then he will dispose it and I will get hold of it and read it. So there is this RSA 129 challenge, okay? There was a whole article written by somebody in there where he describes the RSA 129 challenge and I go, so this was a challenge by Martin Gartner. He said like anybody who actually factors RSA 129, he will give them a hundred dollars, okay? And I went, you know, how hard that can be? Okay, let me go read and try to understand what the hell this is. And that's what triggered my interest in mm -hmm. cryptography. And then over time it became worse and worse so, you know, in India, we actually have entrance exams for going to med school. So in my state, I topped it. So I didn't have much of a choice, but to go to a med school. So I was very clear that nothing is going to happen when I'm in med school. And when I'm done, I'll be done with it. So when I finished, I went and 
you know, worked in various places doing research and security and cryptography. And then it went, you know, it led to the path where I am right now. Okay. Interesting. So I know that you are um, doing some projects in bioinformatics. Like, can you explain what it is? Oh, I'm not doing anything now in bioinformatics. I, I have done some work in transitional bioinformatics. And uh, these days, for the past couple of months, mostly what I've been doing is uh, helping uh, various governments around the world uh, with a COVID track and trace, uh, mm. you know, essentially providing advice on privacy preserving machine learning and privacy preserving track and trace. And sometimes it just boils down to helping them understand technologically what they are thinking about translates to in that sense. So, uh, you know, when the, at a very high level, if so, you are responsible for, uh, you know, looking after a country for track and trace, your understanding of the technology and the privacy implications are kind of limited. So in one country, for example, my classmate from med school is re responsible for track and trace. So I have been helping him for the past few weeks uh, with, you know, what the implications are of making various choices, how these choices impact uh, long-time implications. And on the other side, I've done some agent-based modeling. So as you probably have uh, recognized and have done, if you have ever wanted to do crypt token engineering stroke crypto economics, mm -hmm. you need to use various tools, tools and simulation. So those tools, literally, when we use that to do agent-based simulation, you are just modeling them for economic behavior, but you can actually use them to model human behavior in COVID. So I've done mm -hmm. some of that work. And then I've, uh, you know, I've been working with the ocean guys in that sense. So they have some interest in allowing people to use the data set to do some work related to COVID. These are the kind of stuff I've been doing. I've not been doing hardcore bioinformatics mm. per se. So that okay. was like the donkey's years ago. Okay. And what was it then, back then? Oh, so it was very primitive at that point in time. So I should give you some context to give you an idea of what it was. So uh, at that point in time, we didn't have cloud. What we had was, mm. uh, you know, a, a very large Linux beable clusters which is essentially you have a whole bunch of nodes connected, you run something like MPICH, and effectively the difference between uh, the old paradigm of compute and the new paradigm of compute is old paradigm is pessimistic. Essentially, you keep hold of every transaction that's happening, you keep tabs of it, and then you make sure that it's completed, right? In a cloudy world, is optimistic. So the way I normally describe a map reduced to everybody is like, imagine you go to a place, you meet somebody at a party, and this is an imaginary world, but the person gives you the phone number, but you can't call mm -hmm. them, right? So you get 26 of your friends in a room, and then you have the whole directory for the place. And then you give each of them, you know, alphabet A is going to be one friend of yours uh, until Z is given, right? And then you say to them, I'm going to read out a number, put your, put your mm -hmm. hand up, then you find the number of the person that I'm just reading out, right? So that's the map part. And the reduce part is when they put their hand up, you know what the answer is. This is the map reduce. And the assumption there is all the people that are in the room are actually not going to disappear, right? There are other strategies that are there, but this is the significant difference. So in the past, we didn't have this ability to do in an optimistic sense. We had to do pessimistic. So we had these libraries, which are mostly, mostly written for doing massive uh, linear algebra operations. And so we had bioinformatics Essentially, it came out of human genome being sequenced. This is like early 2000, right? And we didn't have enough of an infrastructure to really do large string searches, right? So effectively, what you do is you take a large uh, string of DNA, you cut it into pieces, and then you need to rearrange it to get to back to that, right? So there were things that were there. One of the things that we were involved in is, uh, you know, paralyzing BLAST. BLAST was its initial search kind of thing. And it was like a single node and we were looking at paralyzing it. So if you have like a, you know, thousand nodes, you know, you actually need to paralyze it really well. You probably know I'm down slow, right? There is like a, a very, very, very direct correlation between how much of paralyzation or speed up can you get and the amount of paralyzation in code. The more paralyzation in code you have, the higher the number of nodes you can run and get benefit out of it. So, you know, this is the kind of stuff that we were trying to do, you know, look at string matching algorithms mm -hmm. and things of that sort and then paralyzing them so that other people could use it. Okay. I see you're making an analogies with uh, blockchain yeah. projects. So yes. that's what eventually helped you to, you know. Yes. 
to come here. Um, I would be asking maybe some kind of random questions, oh, but uh, they're interested, uh, interesting for me. Like, what do you think is the most interesting technology uh, on the market right now? Wow. I mean, it depends, right? Like to me, uh, there are so many things so, because I have a lot of interest in lots of things and I've dabbled with so many things. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I look at it in terms of uh, what is the impact on humanity in the short term, immediate terms. So for me, this space of uh, AI stroke ML, where intersection of deep learning stroke uh, in a generalized visual networks, that kind of stuff is like super, super interesting. It is going to have, in the immediate, short, short mid, medium term future, it is going to have massive impact. If you're going to you know, extrapolate that and uh, talk about quantum computing and where quantum mm -hmm. computing touches both the cybersecurity piece and the machine learning piece, that becomes even more interesting. So if, if, if you look at, you know, it depends on what you're looking at. Like, you know, what lens are we wearing? Are we wearing the cybersecurity lens? Are we looking at society as a whole lens? Mm -hmm. Are we looking at a singularity sense? You know what I'm saying? So, you know. It depends. Okay, and in the blockchain space, which technology do you think, or oh, set of technologies? Yeah, I have to admit, I'll be very biased. I have a lot of interest in zero knowledge uh, proofs, proof systems. So, you know, zero knowledge proof systems have had a significant improvement over the last few years. And one of the things that I should say and point out why I am biased in this sense is even though some of the, uh, you know, early improvements, so for example, SNARKs, they came in in 2013 and they got deployed really, really early on. The first real implementation w was in the blockchain space. So we had Zcash, right? And right. then what has actually happened in 2017, 2018, there was stocks that came out. And now if you look at Ethereum, and there are implementations to do rollups using stocks and both SNARKs and stocks. The stockware is put out a rollup that actually uses stocks. And, uh, you know, I can't remember the other guy, Alex and the rest of the guys, they put out another one using snarks and there are other rollups as well. So, and there are lots and lots of improvements that are happening. So it's like mm -hmm. a whole suite of new protocols that have come out in the last, uh, last year. In 2019, it was, uh, uh, you know, if I were to quote uh, Eli Ben Sasson, the Cambrian revolution of uh, zero knowledge proofs have happened. So to me, I am seeing a lot of progress as in like, I believe there will be a lot more new things that'll be coming out that'll have significant impact. So I would probably say it this way, even though I kind of focus very much on zero knowledge proofs, I think the intersection of three things, the intersection of MPCs, uh, you know, FHEs and zero knowledge proofs, they, they kind of overlap, which is a weird overlap. It is going to have significant impact on blockchain and a whole bunch of paradigms in compute. Yeah, uh, the second technology I didn't recognize, multi-party computation. Uh, but, 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 yeah, yeah, uh, uh, homomorphic, FHE, fully, ho FHEs, ah, FHE, FHE, fully homomorphic, fully homomorphic, 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 homomorphic encryption. Yeah, yeah, yeah I yes, agree. Yeah, yeah. Um, you've touched the ocean protocol. You know, yes, we, we have one project uh, on it right now. It's, I will tell people just in general uh, why it's interesting. Sure. Um, it employs certain tools to very early, again, early days, yeah, uh, yeah. certain tools to take the data yeah. um, that is confidential to a certain extent, okay. make some calculations on this yeah. data and yeah. provide the result. And basically, and during this procedure, the confidentiality of data is preserved. Data is not leaked. So currently okay. when some company needs to analyze, yeah, I'm not telling it to, to you, I just to the audience. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so now uh, in order to analyze big chunk of, chunks of data, you have to send it to some server. And this is risky because the server could be so like hacked, data can be like stolen. So instead of that, um, tools are developed to analyze data on your device or on your server. So it's not going anywhere. And this is, it will change the landscape yeah, significantly. And the homomorphic encryption is one of the technology that allows you to make um, computations on encrypted data. So the, the one who analyzes the data doesn't even know which data they are looking at. So these are indeed very interesting technologies. So yeah, uh, I agree. Um, 
and especially if together with quantum, I'm now like uh, studying quantum computations. Yeah. So it's uh, very interesting. And, um, you should you should read Nielsen and Chang to start with. I was looking for my Nielsen and Chang. It's a very uh, good I have it. Okay. I have it. I have another book. Um, Which one? It's called uh, Quantum Computing Since uh, Democritus. Oh, uh, God, Scott Aronson. Uh, no. Okay. I, I know Scott, but uh, you know, given I know that you have a mathematical background, I don't. I wouldn't suggest you read that one. I think you should go straight for Nielsen. So I, I, I've actually met uh, Bennett, Brazat, uh, Grover, Wazirani, Mike Mosca. Uh, for a very short, brief while, I didn't say this to you, but for uh -huh. a very brief while, I did some work on quantum authentication protocols. So I took a bunch of workshops in TAFR and you know, looked mm. at various things. So uh, I, I, I'm very, and even I had a startup that was doing a QC. So okay. I, I'm very familiar with uh, all these things, yeah. Interesting. So my recommendation okay, yeah, would be, uh, my recommendation to you would be definitely go. Yeah, this is my Nielsen and Chang. Uh, there you go. It's from very first editions. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I have it. Yeah, <laughs> I have the hard cover. I bought it on you know on Amazon for uh, like nine, ninety bucks. You know, it was delivered. Oh, wow, okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. Right. Uh, uh, because like it, 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 the thing is like most of the other ones, I would also recommend Feynman's book, uh, you know, the lectures in compute. Yeah, yeah. That's also very good because it's like my copy is upstairs, but you know, that's one of the ones I would really recommend anybody from a quasi mathematical background to walk into this because Feynman is the person who actually explained to other people that, uh, you know, this is possible. And he describes the reversible compute and all those things. It's pretty interesting. You know, what's interesting, what I see certain like um, similarities about how quantum uh, world uh, works and how yeah. like pe how people work. So if it, um, <laughs> I don't know, yeah, I have no idea. <laughs> uh, no, what, what, imagine that if I ask you, just yeah. okay, let's let's turn to political. Whether you support yeah. Trump or let's. Oh, move okay. I see what you mean. Okay. Sixteen and uh, support Trump or Hillary, and then. Uh, you have in your mind certain yeah. like um, you know pros and cons, and you are in a superposition state, um, and you know a lot of people are in a superposition state in any moment, uh, given a moment of time. And then yeah. if they asked right now, they may give produce some answer. But yeah, this answer you know, you never know. And then uh, after looking for some um, other news, uh, mm. there you know. They may be, the situation may have changed. Yeah. So basically, and then you can combine, you can connect people to each other and they are like uh, entangled. So yeah. they kind of shift uh, their... Uh, hey, uh, so you're, you're, taking, you're taking the Schrodinger's cat example and putting it into human example. Yeah. Oh, I, I, you, you are almost kind of saying, oh, yeah, there's a different way to uh, describe this, but... Uh, all I meant to say is there's this no cloning theorem, right? So essentially you can't. Yeah, yeah. yeah and right. you can't, exactly. And you yeah, cannot yeah, clone yeah. the person yeah. as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but you can take the person um, as a, like, um, you know, a qubit in a yeah. classical form. Let's yeah. say you have not, no idea about like cooking uh, bread. Yeah. And then somebody yeah. comes and teaches you how to cook bread. And that's yeah. like a classic form. And then somebody yeah. else comes and says, oh, no, no, you're wrong. That's how it should work. And then yeah. you can turn the positions. And I think that's exactly what uh, some people do with society. Yeah. They understand how people mind works. And through yeah. Facebook or some other tools, they're changing the, their uh, like attitude uh, to certain things. I, I, so you can actually, say, I believe, uh, sorry, yeah, I believe I, you I, can I, actually make yeah. computations on people and on society. Okay, you said something, this is very interesting. So I, I'm sure you've been watching MIT. There are a bunch of people there. Uh, uh, it's mostly Alex, Sa Alex Sandy Patlin's group who has been looking at the social dynamics that you kind of refer to. There are a couple of papers that, that, that are there. I was just talking to somebody else about that. Somebody mm -hmm. who is an MIT alum. So I, I know somebody from his group. So I was just mm -hmm. talking about them. So definitely there is a group that I've been looking at Social dynamics, uh, I think they call it physics of something. I can't remember exactly what it's called, but you could definitely see the group from, they are from the media group, is Alex Santi Patlin and a couple of other people. 
Uh, mm. They also have done some work on blockchain. You probably might recognize them. I might have their book somewhere over here. Uh, they published two books. Let me just see if I had a book outside. You know, I haven't uh, probably watched that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I watched I uh, one course, yeah. um, half a course about quantum computation. I, I guess it okay. was from Stanford. Yeah, but oh. not from MIT. Who, who from Stanford? If you, if you, if you don't mind. Uh, that's a very famous. If you go to YouTube and okay. see quantum, you know, physics, then you know you'll find. Oh, okay. All right. Reason. Okay. Okay. Um, hmm. I, I don't know who that is, but yeah, anyway, so there are a whole bunch of people. So there was a course, if I know, if I remember rightly, it's 343 from Princeton or something like that. It was an awesome course, 243 or 343. And mm -hmm. then I, I got interested. This is a lot, very long while back. I, I found this course to be super useful. He builds all the way from linear algebra to, you know, Dirac notations and all those things. And then you know, he explains everything properly. So to me, that was like super useful. Yeah, what I, what I want to convey here is that very soon, mm. uh, we will be able to do computations on everything that is alive. Um, possibly, certainly. possibly. possibly and, yeah. I mean, very soon, like 50 years, and then society yeah. will get enormous computational resources. And uh, the good question, how we will use it and how the cybersecurity will look like in this case. Oh, that, because, that, that's uh, an interesting problem. That's a massively interesting problem. I mean, uh, you, as you rightly pointed out, a Shor's algorithm really throws a spanner into the works. So all the problems that we have in the NT complete space will go into the P space. Uh, you know, effectively, integer factorization, discrete log problem, both in discrete log pro problem in a generic sense and elliptic curve discrete log problem. Both of yeah, them will, will, will get reduced to finding cycles in abelian fields, which is considered very much a linear thing. And that implies that all the hard problems which we have over phones, our, our credit cards, our blockchain. Will all be yeah, yeah, yeah. But, I mean, not, not, not all NP problems will be like so easy. No, no, not all. Not, no, but these ones, right? Definitely. Yeah, yeah, these factors, definitely. You know, yeah, yeah. These, these definitely. You know, there are some other classes of problems that will be hard. So, for example, knapsack problems will remain hard, but uh, as you know, knapsack problems there are solutions to it, except with the exceptions of Chow River's densities of points at point eight or point nine. All the rest of the knapsack problems are solvable in uh, polynomial time. So, you know, there are a whole bunch of those problems. Uh, yeah, you know, we have to, uh, yeah. you know, the calm down the people and say that uh, there are already post quantum <laughs> algorithms. So blockchain yeah. will be like updating and will be safe. Yeah, so, we, and we now, were talking about stocks, thanks. right? We, we, we were already yeah. talking about stock. Stocks uh, actually, you know, the fry implies they are uh, quantum resistant. So th this, again, we have two sets of things that we will be ending up using, three sets at least. One is the coding theory based ones. So in that sense, if you think about fry, fry is literally coding theory, right? So you have Macaulay's and other ones that are public key crypto that actually uses coding theory. So, you mm -hmm. know, uh, stock goes into that category. So those ones are definitely going to be resistant to, you know, quantum attacks in that sense. And then there are NTRU kind of things and computing with errors kind of things. So different classes of problems are that are there that are reasonably scalable. Uh, and mm -hmm. NIST already has like a competition that's been running for a while for post-quantum secure algorithms. Yeah, the one issue is that their uh, length of their keys could be, yeah. will be significantly much, much longer. Yeah, much longer. Yeah. Larger. yeah, I mean, that's pretty much in line with what you see in snarks and stocks, right? It's like, uh, you know, so the my mark. expectation is, yeah. So if you are already trying to use rollups with, uh, you know, stocks, okay, what's the difference? <laughs> your key size is going to be the same size as what you're going to have uh, as your rollup. So that's something that you should be able to come to terms with. Yeah, I mean, with the increase of the data storage, it's, it's not going to be a big problem. Um, yeah. Definitely, we need to uh, keep the quantum computers busy. <laughs> with oh, <laughs> I, so, you know, uh, you're absolutely right. Quantum computers will be kept busy by lots of things. To me, the interesting ones are the real biological problems, right? So, for example, you asked me about uh, bioinformatics, right? One of the things that uh, people are interested in bioinformatics and transitional bioinformatics is, a computational dark discovery, or you know, 
computationally optimized drug discovery. So, you know, imagine you have a disease and this disease is caused by expression of a particular enzyme and you want to actually prevent this enzyme from activating. So you look at, you know, a whole bunch of, uh, you know, ingredients that can actually have some effect on this small lock, right? So you have a bunch of keys and then there are a bunch of ligands you can attach and then you want to actually structure them. So you start from all the way from the DNA, you do the primary structure, which is the amino acids, then the secondary structure, how they fold up, uh, you know, tertiary, how other pieces are there, how the quaternary, different pieces get together, right? The, the different pieces sit together, they actually form the enzyme. And now the key needs to go in. How do you actually optimize this? That's like a complete NP complete problem, right? And things like this will be really easier to compute when we have quantum computers, right? So we might have better solutions to problems in the domains like, uh, you know, drug discovery, treating diseases, uh, you know, structuring, you know, finding structural proteins. I don't know, all those kind yeah. of very hard problems that are hard right now. Yeah, that's like the, I read that the, now the top um, supercomputer is now installed in Japan. And yeah. it's twice faster as uh, Summit, I believe. And yeah. uh, it's uh, occupied with finding the, you know, vaccine for COVID-19, so. I mean, it's, this, this is what I was saying, like, you know, uh, uh, so when I was talking about the startup that I used to work for, uh, we actually hired, uh, I mean, sorry, we acquired VLNX and uh, it's a you know, trivia. So uh, after I left, they delivered number four in top 500. So mm -hmm. I have actually come across the, the challenge of designing these things, right? It's interesting problem. And generally speaking, having like massive computational uh, mm -hmm. nodes allows you to do uh, things that are scalable, literally going back to the conversation we were having the really early on. So if you are trying to find, uh, you know, receptors for COVID, you know, you're probably looking at the structure of the, you know, what do I call uh, the external shell of COVID viruses, right? And then mm -hmm. seeing, you know, are, the, are there other things that you could actually use to, you know, bind to it? Or you'll be looking at, okay, how does this actually replicate? Can I inhibit this replication by inhibiting one of these enzymes? Going back to my previous conversation, right? We have a structure of a, a structure represented in an RNA, gets converted into DNA, DNA then becomes a string of amino acid, amino acid then gets folded into proteins, and proteins can have multiple pieces and all the pieces get together and all these pieces get together, it actually does things. One of the things that you could do could be replicate you know, COVID viruses. And if we actually find this key that blocks this thing from you know, mm -hmm. act, you know, allowing this enzyme, you know, the site that has an enzyme activity if it may being exposed, we have a, 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 a what do I call an anti antiviral that prevents this COVID thing from replicating. Yeah, uh, and I think the, the deeper we go, the more yeah. similarities we will see between the no, like the normal viruses and the computer viruses. Oh yeah, I mean, there are definitely a lot of it, right? And so if you think about polymorphic viruses, I mean, I'm sure you know polymorphic viruses. So polymorphic viruses for people who are not familiar with it is like viruses that actually change their behavior, appearance every time they appear. Yeah. So they are very similar to the influenza viruses. For influenza viruses, every season, they, 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 they mutate really fast. And actually the COVID virus is kind of in mm -hmm. the same class of coronavirus in that sense. And they can actually have this ability to change their shape. And I say the shape, essentially what that means is like, if you have a, a, you know, a, a vaccine that's prepared for a, a virus of this, in this kind, the next time mm -hmm. it comes in, it, you are not able to recognize the virus because it's changed the color, right? You know what I'm saying, right? Mm -hmm. So it, it is ineffective. Uh, so it's yeah, absolutely yeah. right. The, if you think of polymorphic viruses, the behavior of this influenza viruses and other kind of viruses are very similar. Yeah, I recently read uh, the book from the, you know, Cre not creator, the, the guy who found DNA. It was very interesting. Oh, okay. Uh, the book okay. is, uh, you know, uh, I connected a few dots between blockchain field yeah. and okay. the, uh, you know, the sequ gen genome sequencing in this space. And yeah. it was really interesting that in 1970s and 80s, a lot of people were against these technologies. Yeah. And they demanded that it will be prohibited. And the scientists yeah. were like kind of yeah, under attack. Yeah. And certain some of them even stopped doing any research and were defunded and yeah. etc. And um, 
that's kind of for us it's for me at least it seems like okay 2020s uh, modern age and uh, genome sequence is a very recent thing but the foundations of it were laid very long time ago and yeah. the industry already passed all these issues and that's what we we may experience as well when we see now that and many people will support that that we should not uh, like scientific people should not uh, do work for government because government may use it for the like bad purposes or so on and they demand to like stop the research so there are a lot of social implications of any any emerging tech and basically yeah, I mean, this it, is like, it's, it's not the first time right so it's like if you look about you're talking about uh, you know x-ray crystallography of protein and other structures were really in the the time around when they really found uh, DNA structure, right? And when the DNA structure was found, uh, at that moment in time, they didn't have all the tools that they really wanted to do what we can do right now, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, one of the things I have a bit of interest is synthetic biology. I have actually co-authored a paper with Anders Sandberg. I really, we didn't end up publishing for various reasons. Uh, well, it was more looking at the security of uh, synthetic biology and things of that sort. So we have reached a point in time where if you and I, people like us, if you really wanted to, you know, sequence something, if we, you know, we could easily do that. So that's like really pushing the envelope to a degree where, you know, uh, the difference between information systems and physical systems in the biological space, it's almost disappeared, right? So yeah. they exist, yeah. So the existence of anything, uh, as an informational string is equivalent of actually having the biological object. And it's funny, I think the medicine and the information security will kind of became the same. Merge. Thing, become the oh same yeah, thing, I mean, it's, it's, it's already happening. So imagine this, like if you had a pacemaker implant implanted, right? Say the security of that implant is a security of you, right? Yeah. Pretty much. So it's a straightforward, right? It's no, nothing in that sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And if you have uh, a, if, if you had a brain computer interface, like a very stupid one, even a one that you can actually put in where you are trying to prevent epilepsies, right? If somebody mm -hmm. hacks into it, you know, it'll have very interesting implications, right? So a lot of the people who are in medicine who do other things don't really understand the security implications of any, all of the things that you are, the way you are understanding it. I'm surprised that you are not offering some of your you know, expertise to other people who are interested in those spaces. Yeah, I, actually, I'm planning to. I was thinking about like biosecurity or something like that. But again, we, I need to learn some things before that. Yeah. Um, uh, at this moment of time, like uh, obviously the topic of in polymorphic viruses is very important yeah. because they, yeah. it's kind of, it's you could consider them alive to a certain extent uh, because that's how evolution, you know, oh, yeah, uh, absolutely. makes things evolve. Yeah. yeah. So j just to give you an example, so I would really uh, point you at a paper. Uh, it, it is, uh, we did talk about P and NP, right? Uh, polynomial and non-polynomial. Uh, there is this uh, traveling salesman problem, which everybody in, uh, you know, computation is normally yeah. aware of. Essentially, it's like you have five places to go to. What's the optimal path uh, which you can have where you can go to each of the different places only going once, right? This is considered a hard problem. And oh, there was a paper published by Len Edelman uh, in the late 80s, uh, if I'm not mistaken. It's called Molecular Solution to Combinatorial Problems. The interesting reason why I mentioned this is exactly what you described. So what he does is he proposes a solution to this problem by taking two DNA strips, right? One, he considers mm -hmm. one to be uh, you know, a shortest one and one to be the longest one, and then he hybridizes it. Once you do hybridization, the equilibrium state actually represents the solution to this problem. And mm -hmm. when you read this problem, and he actually you know, uh, made some more improvements to this, and he even proposed a solution to DES, the data encryption standard, to decrypt it, right? So you're absolutely right. So effectively, you could use biological biological methods of compute to solve some of the problems in the computational space. Yeah. It's a very interesting ages. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, can you tell us more a little bit? Um, you've done some work for, uh, for Ripple, uh, help something, some for, as I remember for Ethereum, maybe you elaborate a little bit on that. 
Yeah, so uh, uh, for, with Ripple, it was more a case of, uh, you know, when it was really early on. Ripple was uh, soon after the angel round, if I'm not mistaken. I, 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 you know, I was in a oh. Bay Area. I went to Singularity University to do the graduate studies program, whatever that is called right now. So uh, one of the people there was an early investor for Ripple and they wanted me to talk to them and uh, they were interested in my expertise and I was happy to be an advisor. So I looked at various problems in the security space and offered them advice. I mostly worked with Stefan and I probably won't be able to go into details of what I worked on. Uh, when Ethereum came around, uh, Victor, uh, you know, the, the lead programmer for Swarm, uh, it, it was a friend of mine. I, I've knew, known him prior to Ethereum. And when the Orange paper was published, he asked me to review the Orange paper. So I happened to be one of the reviewers of Orange paper. And ever since I've uh, I spent a bit of time with the Swarm team, I've given a couple of talks. I attended a couple of the Swarm summits. I've given a talk at one of the Swarm summits as well. Pavel, you still there? I switched my video just because you see connection might be not okay. super stable. Okay. okay. And uh, what do you think is the main challenge uh, that stands, you know, it's an obstacle for blockchain projects and which ones maybe like Hashgraph is the one that you would say we should go further? Yeah, except like uh, zero knowledge proofs, which will be used like everywhere. So I think the real problem with adoption of blockchain is more due to the fact that most people who try to blockchainify a protocol don't really see the real economic value add to that particular protocol. Does it really add value to the people that uh, are using it, right? So, you know, you can tokenize airtime, but the question is like, does it really bring benefit to people that are using it on the phone, right? You can tokenize uh, this interaction, but the question then is like, does it really bring uh, better utility for anybody that's involved in this conversation. So that's, I think, mostly the problem. And there are other problems on the side. The other problems on the side definitely includes the FAT protocol thesis, right? Just the fact that any protocol captures the value. Unless we have crypto, crypto economically efficient protocols, that is going to be a challenge. Then the classical problems that are there, which is like the uh, you know issue of privacy, the issue of scalability, things of that sort, right? There's a long list of things. I think the primary problem is that of a network effect, right? Mm -hmm. So you need to have users who actually get benefit that is well within the ecosystem. So someone wants to do something, you can go back to the virus scenario, right? We can actually think about a virus trying to infect somebody else, uh, you know? And literally you could think about COVID. The COVID can only spread if and only if there are enough of susceptible population, right? So this is that, that that's why there's this massive push for vaccination, right? So if you have a, you know immunity to herd immunity in that sense to the virus, the virus completely disappears because the probability of spreading decreases significantly. This is exactly happening to blockchain protocol. Blockchain protocol goes into the wild and meets people, and out of that, the people who are actually you know not immune to blockchain protocol are tiny, yeah. so it just dies out. So that's exactly what is happening. Um, actually, I look at this issue from a different perspective. Mm -hmm. Like, I wouldn't try to spread the blockchain protocols, but rather mm -hmm. the use cases. So like Bitcoin, you don't need to tell the person what is blockchain or whatever, some issues to explain what Bitcoin is. Or at least, okay, if they believe you, and you say this is secure, like just keep track of your phone, whatever the, yeah. the keys, and just yeah. use it as, as a commodity or as money, or uh, that's it. And basically, so there are certain risks associated, but there are certain benefits associated with yeah. using Bitcoin or like Tether or something like that. So in Tether, we have additional risk of you know insolvency of the company <laughs> behind that. Yeah, I mean, it's a huge risk. Um, at one, once it will strike, definitely. Uh, and basically, but it solves the problem. It solves the problem of people of censorship resistance, uh, of privacy, etc., etc. Tether is look, ni Tether is neither to censorship resistant nor 
Does yeah, it show yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. It's in the, okay. Uh, again, it's like this anonymity. It has many yeah. aspects. Yes, less. Yeah. And people people may like the one aspect and don't care don't about like the other. other. Yeah. So yeah. For the for the tether, it yeah. it's privacy in terms of transactions, not in. Uh, Censorship, censorship resistant in terms of transactions, not in terms of the collateral, you know? Yeah. Which yeah. is also, again, it's the collateral yeah. risk. <laughs> uh, and yes. again, I saw many cases where people was, were thinking, were, very, were yeah. convinced that if they yeah. put their asset or smart contract on Ethereum, that yeah. they will increase the security of their system. Mm. Or it's safer to buy a token for an mm. asset than to buy whatever uh, warehouse receipt for the same asset. And I told them, guys, it's the same. If asset is stolen, it's the same collateral risk. It doesn't matter whether it's on, on Ethereum or on the paper. It's just- Oh yeah, absolutely. It, it will work worth yeah. zero. So, but uh, where I'm, I'm coming to is like certain technologies first benefited individual, or most of the technology mm -hmm. benefited individual and then these technologies could be united in certain network. Yeah. And uh, like, first we've got a display and that was beneficial for many people and then we've got television. Yeah. And first we've got uh, operational operating system and then we've got the internet yeah. and, uh, and so on and so forth. And basically um, in the case of blockchain, I treated in a, for, if we talk about businesses, banks or whatever, I treat it not as the way to unite them from the day one, yeah. but rather make uh, their accounts, ledgers, clients, like structured and yeah. protected by cryptography. So yeah. you first need to make up your own house and then talk yeah. about like the, the street. <laughs> and uh, yeah. basically, uh, like most of the companies I'm talking to, mm. they don't have open APIs. No. Even if they do, these APIs do not support digital identity. So yeah. authentication is like old fashioned. Yeah. Hello, my call, name is John. Yeah. 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 Who you are you? Who are you? Send, yeah. Right. Who are you? Um, send me a picture. Tell me 10 exactly. friends of yours. Yeah. And then who's your, even if who's your dog? <laughs> yeah. Even if they have digital identity and authentication, some bank ID, for example. Yeah. So, um, their APIs do not support the digital signature. So, any yeah. response that you get in from them, mm. balance in the bank, is not mm. signed. Uh, yeah. So, you, it's the data that you never can trust. You yeah. trust only because it's like, it happens right now. It's like, <laughs> it's like with deep fake. People trust videos because it looks like the original one. So, yeah. we have, this issue is massive. Like, the, mm. the Digital data is not protected anyhow. So, yeah. so the third point, the first open API, second digital identity, and third is the cryptographic, uh, you know, protection of this yeah. inter of information exchange will yeah. benefit almost every company. And oh, then, yeah. then number four is basically the ability to reconcile data or do uh, to like Providence. real time yeah, yeah, yeah. audit, yeah. like in generally audit. And yeah. then, yes, you need the consensus feature of blockchain and yeah. you need uh, many of these advancements where you have the, uh, the environment where many companies need to exchange data, not just the company and the client. Yeah. And I think that most of the uh, projects out there, they try to solve problem number four before yeah. solving problem one, two, and three. And uh, most of them, I think they are failing because they try to gather a committee yeah uh, and usually committees produce you know the, the famous jokes at zebra is the yeah. horse designed by a committee yeah so. I, mean, I think i was about to say this is like a, i was about to take a example from medicine right mm. so this is more a case of like you treating the symptoms rather than the underlying cause right you you know you can give symptomatic treatment as, as soon as you withdraw the you know the, the treatment you're giving to prevent the symptom from appearing, the disease reappears. So if you really want to stop four, it is a yeah. symptom of the underlying problems. So you need to solve one, two, and three to actually prevent four from happening, right? Uh, yeah, and that's why I'm not trying to come out there and uh, convince people to use blockchain because 
for them it will be like magic it's just yeah it would be super hard to to understand uh, yeah. but rather show them the practicality of the unexisting issues that they may not be even aware of yeah. until they see this how it could work they may not so um, but definitely like Bitcoin for example does a job without any marketing it just works yeah. <laughs> and that's it <laughs> I mean, so, there was some marketing early on like if you look at the really early phases that there, there was a bunch of marketing and you know now no longer really requires marketing it is taken off in that sense there's enough of people in this ecosystem and i would say there is a lot of people lots of uh, interest right you know the way i would describe yeah. it is yeah you know the the, the exchanges have the interest like look at the total crypto ecosystem crypto ecosystem out of the 200 plus billion that's out there uh, you know 180 is just bitcoin right so if you are on exchange, you do transactions, even going back to Tether you are describing, for Tether to make money, you need to have a, you know, the value of Bitcoin at a particular place, right? Mm -hmm. So there are lots of interesting interests, orthogonal interests, let me put it that way, right? And you know, look again at the people who do mining. Again, mining for them to make money, uh, the price of Bitcoin has to be at a particular place. So there are a lot of incentives, you know, if you're talking about Bitcoin, when like back in 2010 or 2011, when people like you and I were playing around with it, there was a very different game. There were no massive exchanges. There was nobody actually had massive economic incentive in being sure, you know, the, the, the value of this, you know, asset was at this space, right? There were no ETFs. There were no futures. There were no derivatives. So it, it, now, now the Bitcoin ecosystem has completely changed. You know, uh, you can't actually think of all the games that are going on in this ecosystem. It's so complicated. It's incredibly hard. The thing that we are only seeing is the tip of the iceberg. Uh, you know, the shift in prices that we see is like the effect of the things that are going underneath. Yeah, yeah that's definitely. In, like it's um, from this, for the same reason, it's, it's hard for people to perceive Bitcoin as the, you know, payment mechanisms or store of value. It's rather like transport uh, layer or you can securely send value over yeah. internet because the uh, speculators, which are attracted by the anonymity mm. of the, you know, the ecosystem can do whatever they like. Yeah. And using these derivatives and everything influence uh, the market significantly. Yeah, absolutely. So this is something, to a certain extent, something new. Hmm. Because it used to be that people like knew who they were trading with or talking yeah. with. And now it's yeah. like it's blurring. So I'm watching this with big interest. What, will, what, what the outcome will be. Whether uh, there will be some appearance of reserve currencies etc actually i want to ask your opinion yeah i was about to say apologies for interrupting there, there seems to be so much interest picking up right so look at canada look at south korea look at you know, all the different countries uh, pretty much all the countries that we can think of uh, they're already you know putting somebody to have a look at cbdc's so, you know the kind yeah. of currency that yeah so it, it's an interesting so you are about to ask me a question apologies for interrupting. yeah exactly i was just asking about cbdc but you started to talk that's <laughs> that's great um uh, i'm involved in a few projects in this field okay yeah and basically uh the biggest uh problem for us yeah. at this yeah. moment is to explain that first it's not a cryptocurrency yeah and you should it's not a expect... Very, yeah, the behavior of a cryptocurrency in here. This is yeah. a very different mechanism. This is literally, you have a currency, whether it's a paper-based one that you have in your wallet, mm. like this one, or, you know, if it's a, a electronic one, it's going to be no different because you have a backer and your backer is a central government and they could do the quantitative easing, right? Yeah. Typically, one of the real reasons what everybody goes into crypto is this decoupling from fiat. And because of all the reasons I described of the games that's going on in the Bitcoin space, Bitcoin is no longer really decoupled from the uh, you know, things that are happening in the normal space. That is very evident when the COVID really hit, because if you look at it, so if you think of a miner, you know, imagine there are no futures available if you're a miner. 
you, what you could literally do is like your decision is like, can I borrow the money from the open market at a rate by which I can actually make money by doing mining? Okay. And that's a leverage you're going to have. So you literally yeah. go in and look at it and you go, okay, if the price of Bitcoin at this point in time is this much, if I do a DCF, does it make a logical decision for me to deploy capital to do mining, right? So that is literally really shifted the crypto economics of Bitcoin. So literally what has happened now is you actually have the total amount of hash function or the hardness of Bitcoin directly linked to the interest rate in an open market, which is like a bizarre, bizarre situation that a lot mm. of people would say, no, that's not true. Oh, good. Have a look, right? There are enough papers out there. I will you know, definitely point people at papers by Shunya Noda and other people. You can actually see. And there are other games to be played. You can actually game, you can play games with, uh, you know, how miners could actually work with exchanges on certain things, right? Uh, you know, a whole bunch of games being played. So it's like, it's, it's an interesting situation. But now if it's, we are talking about CBDCs, the whole game is not going to be played by these guys, but as a centralized entity. The, the real difference is the shift in paradigm effectively is normal cryptocurrencies in a general sense of speaking, they are decentralized. Whereas a CBDC is a centralized one. So essentially you have trust in the hierarchy, trust hierarchy mostly represented by cryptographic keys that's being issued by a nation state, okay? So there are a couple of things that changes. Firstly, firstly the adversarial model changes. So in a normal scenario, when you look at normal cryptocurrencies, you think of everybody else as like adversaries and you don't normally think of like the nation states as being adversaries. But here, this is pretty much a case of you will have nation status adversaries. And then you have this crazy situation where normally cryptocurrencies don't have the monetary policies attached to them that is very much linked to the policies and the politics of a country. And this becomes really entangled. So you can actually have this, you know, increase and decrease on availability of uh, your CBDC in the market. And then there's this, all the market games that's going on, which will make it all very interesting. Yeah, I think these issues that you've touched are indeed important, but I think the, the closer issue will be um, providing access to worldwide audience to certain currency. Now I mean, it may not be. CBDCs don't have to, right? So other than maybe to. US, don't, they don't have to. So, so for example, in the UK, so if I look at my pound, my pound states very simply, you know, to the bearer of this and literally, you know, to the bearer of this, uh, you know, you actually have this value of like 10 pounds, right? So generally that's under, underwriting is pretty much within, you know, wherever the government is, right? So you, this is not a bad legal tent outside of the country, right? Sometimes. So for example, Indian currency is not a valid legal tender. I'm reasonably certain yeah. Ukrainian currency is not, right? So this, this is the challenge. So if you're thinking about things like that, we have a slightly different situation. You actually have like, you know, currency that you could use in various places. So even though you're doing a CBDC and people outside of the country might have access to CBDCs, uh, for you, the key audience is the audience within your, within your governance, the place where you govern in that sense. It, yeah, it is, but only if your government is stable enough. If it's not, <laughs> for most of them, yeah, they're yeah. not. Then you would rather use the US dollar or euro or, you know, Chinese yuan or something like that. And now it used to be that it was hard to, to do transactions with the foreign currency, you know, electronic, yeah. electronic yeah. way. You need to go there, open an account, it's like KYC, la la la. And now if yeah. certain CBDCs, and I'm pretty sure that some of them will be yeah. more or less, I wouldn't say anonymous, mm. uh, they will be free to use. Yeah. I believe so. So yeah. you'll be able to register yeah. an account with Chinese, <laughs> yeah. you know, make a picture of yourself and then the app will do the other scanning of your <laughs> smartphone yeah. and yeah. and then you'll be able to use as you like yeah and uh unless you do something bad for chinese yeah, yeah. it will yeah. allow you to do whatever you like yeah and uh basically that will be huge comp competition for the u.s mm. dollar which is mm. intentionally made like that mm. but in the paper form in the paper form is perfect to do whatever you like now it's an yeah. electronic form it's hard I mean, 
Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, I, I completely agree with you. So the true sense of anonymity you actually have in paper form, that is a difficulty that most people have uh, to actually create crypto, right? So there are two things that generally comes in. What is the transaction anonymity? And the other one is the identity anonymity. When you use, you know, literally paper form, you know, if you had some ability to blind it, you can achieve both, meaning as in yeah. like, yeah, right? So, you know, the challenge in CBDCs in that sense is, is unlikely that there will be this shielding. And this is very interesting impact on the average citizen, okay? So what I mean by that is like, you know, if the country has a CBDC and the CBDC doesn't provide the same kind of security characteristic, namely identity privacy and transaction privacy, then people will be very worried. You know, it'll be like, okay, you know, what happened in Korea? Like in Korea, when COVID happened, the, you know, credit card transactions were tracked down. And if they went and shopped when they were supposed to be in locked in, you know, yeah. message will be sent out, right? So imagine a worst, worst case scenario of that, right? So yeah. that's the thing that worries everybody. So most of the people that are in designing CBDCs don't seem to understand the fact that CBDCs has a very strong privacy implication. And the previous exactly. implications of this is not well well understood by the designers of that. Yeah, 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 we, I understand that fully. I'm saying that for most of people who will yeah. be the target of the yeah. CBDC, a real target, they, yeah. um, it's not an issue. They have, yeah. work, they have other issues that have to care about. Yeah. So like you see with this tether, uh, which is not yeah. censorship resistant at all. I mean, in yeah. terms of that collateral, you have the collateral risk, etc. And yeah. people still yeah. using it because they have worse problems to solve. Yeah. And they cannot move money at all. And now they have a solution. Yes, they have yeah. a risk, but they yeah. hope that this risk will not be, you know, will not happen. So I think for the CBDCs, it will be like um, gradually, um, I believe that in the future, you will have a central bank which is run by a smart contract. Yeah. Maybe on 50 years. And it will be private. Uh, private transactions, everything's fine. And in 100 years, it might not be even run by a central bank, but by whatever agreement. Yeah, it could be a da- it's a you know, Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, but I completely before that, agree. Yeah. yeah. Uh, before that, you see even UAE um, um, had zero tax. Yeah. And they had to introduce tax because one of the reasons was that otherwise they would be considered like a tax heaven to like, uh, but I don't know. I mean, uh, I, I'm not a very, you know, great expert on the economic conditions okay. in the UAE, but, anyway. but there, are multiple, there are multiple reasons that's being proposed. Just one is that the revenue that's coming from oil because the price of oil has come down as significantly as one. Yeah. And the other one is absolutely, you're right. You know, given there was no, uh, most of the countries in Middle East don't have income tax. You know, it's been something that's there for a while. So for example, Saudi, you know, you can take any arbitrary country would, which has a reasonable amount of wealth. Uh, what they would do is they would actually give a citizen, uh, you know, almost a UBI in one sense, right? They used to give them money for everything, right? Mm-hmm. That's kind of changing now. And then now they're actually charging their citizens for the services they consume and the money they, you know. Uh, yeah, where I'm heading is that uh, the zero tax is the basically the is a competitive advantage. Yeah, the countries that introduce uh, zero tax for all citizens for whatever like new citizens, they have an advantage in attracting capital, and basically yep. uh, CBDC is the perfect tool to expand beyond physical like locations. So yep. like Estonia has this uh, you know digital ID. Yeah, uh, digital visas or some. It is not a visa, though. It, 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 yeah, so the, the, the e-citizenship program in Estonia is the ability for somebody to actually create a company there. It doesn't translate to a visa. So I, I happen yeah, yeah. to know they, they now have the, some updates. So yeah. they want to attract entrepreneurs, even so okay. even they will be even virtually, but in their okay. like space. So yeah. because again, I believe that in 10, 20 years. The yeah. virtual economy will be greater than the physical economy. Yeah, pretty much, very and likely, yes, yeah. Then you need a new type of government. You need, uh, it's not like coming to a bank, to 
it, it's already happening, right? COVID actually triggered a lot of this. So yeah, if you yeah. look at the total amount of transaction that is happening in the so-called virtual space versus the physical space, the physical space has come down significantly. You know, we, we are part of such a transformation. We are literally uh, interacting virtually rather than physically. You know, we were just describing, we haven't seen each other in like two years. The reason yeah. we couldn't be there is because I was traveling, you were traveling, and like, you know, whenever you organize a conference, I'm in some other part of the world, right? Yeah. This is a virtual situation where I only need to not spend three hours, four hours to travel from London or wherever I am to, you know, mostly places in Ukraine, you're organizing conferences. So I could be just getting on a my machine and virtually transport myself to the place in the virtual space where I can actually talk to the audience, right? Yeah. And that's already happening and it definitely going to, it's only going to increase. A lot of the regulatory barriers were forced to change. Uh, in various countries because of COVID. So there are some good things that happened because of COVID, but there are a lot of bad things that happened, but you know, that's what it is. Yeah, yeah. Okay, Anish. Uh, yes. I think we are like- Done one, one hour of we're killing We're done people. one hour, yeah. 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 Uh, it was very interesting discussion, you know. It's like, um, not, every, not every day I have the ability <laughs> to talk like that. Yeah, so thanks for that. Welcome. Uh, thanks for your time. Yeah. Welcome. It would be great right. to th have th another one you again. in the future. Absolutely. Thank you again very much for you know inviting me and uh, apologies if uh, you know the invite got. Uh, I didn't get the invite in my inbox. I wasn't really sure where the hell it was, and so sorry about the confusion. I think we should probably pick a topic, whichever topic that is. I have expertise in like half a dozen topics, yeah. and we can actually talk about any of them for that matter. It doesn't matter. Like. Uh, you know, it's always interesting talking to you. Yeah. Okay. Thanks yeah, again thank you for your time. Much. Thanks, Welcome. audience, for participating. Yeah. Bye. Bye.